Next, charting the rise of Brazil as a new and growing power on the global stage. Jeffrey Brown profiles one of the men who helped build it. Yes, Brazil is still a soccer power. And yes, it's still famous for its music and carnival. But today, Brazil is something much more. A nation of 200 million, it's now the world's sixth largest economy, an energy giant with a booming manufacturing sector and growing middle class. In short, an economic and democratic power very much on the rise. And decidedly not the nation Fernando Enrique Cardoso was born into. When I was born in 1931, Brazil had only one paved route linking Rio with one of the provinces. One Zero. paved route? One, just one. Brazil was quite apart from the world. It was quite isolated from the core. We, as I said, we are considered as the periphery, the poor periphery of the world. Cardoso, now 81, would become one of the chief architects of Brazil's rise. As both a scholar, he was first a leading thinker on issues of race and development, and has authored or co-written more than 30 books, and then as a political figure, serving as the country's finance minister, and then as president for two terms, from 1995 to 2002. He oversaw the elimination of runaway inflation, opened up markets and instituted social programs that helped launch the country on its present path. Why should we be condemned to be a stagnant as underdeveloped uh, country. I think this is not, 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 not realistic. It would be possible to promote policies to implement a better e uh, economy and to move up the Brazilian economy and to become much more part of the global system. Fernando Enrique Cardoso. It was this rare combination, scholar and politician, that the U.S. Library of Congress cited recently in awarding Cardoso the prestigious Kluge Prize, which the library likens to a Nobel for the humanities and social sciences. And indeed, Cardoso says he started out as a young sociologist in the 1960s with ambitious goals. I would like to change the world, or if not the world, at least to improve the Brazilian situation. His early research helped explode myths on a subject as thorny in Brazil as it is in the U.S., race. The idea was officially that Brazil could be qualified as a racial democracy. Well, it was a myth. We had uh, racial you know, uh, uh, prejudice. We never had law, by law segregation. But Brazil imported 10 times more slaves than America. So we have an enormous population of black people. But the idea of uh, democracy, racial democracy was simultaneously a myth and an aspiration. Brazilian society would have a, a more democratic kind of relationship between blacks and whites. And step by step, we are building up a more uh, open society, more flexible uh, and more, uh, also more democratic with respect to race relations. The other part of your scholarship that gained you so much attention was challenging this idea that, that Brazil would always be a dependent nation, it yeah. would always be on the outside. What, what did you see that made you want to challenge that idea? To me it was clear that there are enormous differences within the periphery. And countries like Brazil or Argentina or Mexico were already becoming industrialized. And they are well establishing ties with the global scene, global markets, you see. I had no idea, this was in the 60s, uh, I had no idea of what was really occurring, the globalization process. We have no words. So the issue was how does a country like Brazil yeah. find its way in this That's right. globalizing market? That's right. That's, what, that's the main question. How to, to keep going democracy, more freedom, capacity of people to organize and also to respect contracts to uh, increase investment, to have good governance. Brazil's lack of democracy, in fact, led to the turning point in Cardoso's life. Military dictatorships forced him first into exile and then returning to Brazil to lose his academic position. By the 1970s, he'd grown more politically active, eventually becoming what he likes to term an accidental president. Cardoso left the presidency in 2002, prevented by law from seeking a third term. The victory by Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva marked an important moment for Brazilian democracy. 
The first time in more than 40 years that one elected civilian president passed power to another. Lula, though leading a rival and more leftist party, kept many of Cardoso's policies and reforms in place, as has his successor, the current president, Dilma Rousseff. Today, Cardoso sees continuing challenges and problems for his country, but also much progress. If I look back and I remember when I was a child in Rio, in Copacabana Beach, with, without sunny towns in the hills in, in Rio, uh, but also a very backward country, and now I can, can see um, a, a much, much more dynamic society in, in Brazil. And now we have democracy, now we have people asking for more, now we have protests, now we have the free press, now we have universities, now we have contacts across the globe. My God, it was an enormous progress. Fernando Enrique Cardoso, thank you for talking to us. I have to thank you. And another symbol of Brazil's progress, it is scheduled to host the Soccer World Cup in 2014 and the Summer Olympics in 2016.